Russians for me be the best baller in the world and be real rich. And he does it! Belmo does what he needed to do to give himself the best chance. There's a spare ball down the middle. Winner. Bowling fans, you have a repeat USBC Masters champion. His name is Jason Belmonte. We are live here on YouTube. Uh, I can't wait to continue this show here on YouTube. It's going to be an exclusive uh, show for my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you don't already, please take this time to subscribe to my channel to make sure that you get your notifications all set up in case I go live when you're unexpected it or if I randomly go live some other day, you'll get those notifications. So be sure to uh, yeah, be a subscriber. Today's show, May the 3rd, well, May the 3rd where I am right now, where my guest is and where many of you are right now, it may be the 2nd of May, we have a huge, huge show. I'm really, really excited about this. My guest in the set key this week is going to be one of the most energetic people I have ever met, one of the greatest players I have ever watched. In fact, I'll go one better and say he is my favorite player that I ever watched throw a ball down the lane, and that is including the professionals. And that guest is Timmy Mack. Uh, I'll be sharing with you in the classroom today uh, how to increase and decrease your rev rate uh, if you need to by a simple understanding of uh, one little trick. So be sure to hang about for that. And as usual, we'll also be doing a giveaway of a prize where one of you guys watching live I uh, will have an opportunity to win a really cool prize. Before I get into the show, though, I want to announce that uh, the PBA have released some information about what is happening uh, for the tour uh, in the short term. And one of the big parts of their news release was the PBA League uh, will be on and there is a virtual draft that will be on Flow Bowling May the 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern. So you need to be a subscriber of Flow Bowling if you would like to watch that virtual draft of the PBA League. And, well, this year is going to be a huge league too because we are adding two new teams, uh, teams from Milwaukee and Las Vegas. And the actual PBA League is scheduled uh, in July in Portland. So that's all been done and um, announced which is really great news for the PBA, plus a whole bunch of other things in their press release. So if you haven't already found out from other sources, head over to pba.com and you can read the rest of the release there. But speaking of the league, one of my best mates in the world also happens to be a manager of one of the PBA league teams, the Portland Lumberjacks. So let's go over to the set team and say good day to Timmy Mack. 
Timmy Mack, how are you, mate? Hey, nice to be, uh, nice to see your face here. It's uh, it's the only time I get a chance to see you in these in these trying times. But um, man, uh, you're over there, I'm here, and uh, listen, it's a pleasure. Any chance I get a chance to talk to you and uh, and have a chat with you? But uh, great to be on the Belmo Show. What can I say? Now I know I'm going mate, forward. So I, look, I want to say um, I'm sorry you weren't my first my first guest on the show. I it was a, a coin flip between you and Kimberly Pressler. And uh, listen, the fans wanted to see Kimberly. So uh, <laughs> I hope you don't feel too bad about that. But uh, you're my second guest. You're my first male guest. Okay. How about yeah, that? I'll take that. Listen, I probably have something to do with the hair. She's, she's just a tad bit uh, more easy on the eyes than I am. You know, I got a funny story about Kimberly. I met her 20 years ago, uh, right when she won the Miss USA. So. Uh, I uh, I would take second fiddle to her anytime. <laughs> so, you know, we've known each other since I was just a pup, really. I mean, the very I remember it very, very clearly. Um, but there, before I, I'm going to ask you about the first time that that we met, and, and from your perspective. But before I get there, I don't know if you know this story or not. But there was an opportunity for me to actually have met you a few years earlier than when we actually did meet. So you were at this point, um, and well, from this point till pretty much even till now, to me anyway, uh, you were a god status in Australia, okay? <laughs> nice. And I, I had um, entered a tournament in Sydney called the Manhattan Super Classic. And at the time, they were offering a reward of $100,000 for 300 and $250,000 for back-to-back 300. So my dad said to me, I was 13 at the time, had never bowled 300. <laughs> and he said, do you think you'll be able to bowl one 300? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe, yeah, let's try it. So he entered me into the tournament. Now this tournament was separated into three squads. And I guess uh, I was in the morning squad and you, Timmy, were in the B squad. So I was in the A and you were in the B squad. So I finished mm. bowling. I didn't bowl very well. I didn't get close to 300, unfortunately. And everyone in the bowling center was talking about Timmy Mack is bowling the next squad. So there still needed to be a lane oil redress and a lunch break. And then your squad was coming in. And I begged my dad, begged him, can <laughs> we stick around so I can watch Timmy Mack bowl? And dad said, I wish I could, but we've got a four and a bit hour drive to get back to Orange. If you hadn't yeah. bowled a little better and made the cut, we could hang around. But I've pretty much told everyone back home we're we're heading home. Oh, I was dirty with him. So how how did I we, miss that? So we get in the car, Timmy. It's four and a half hours, and <sighs> my dad and I didn't talk for the entire ride home because I was so salty that we couldn't stick around for an hour and a half longer to watch Timmy Mac bowl. Then oh. a few years later. Here I am in Brisbane, Queensland, bowling in an invitational tournament, and that's where I first got to shake your hand. So maybe let everybody kind of know from your perspective the day that we met. That's unbelievable. Twenty-one. How, how am I fighting about about this now? Twenty-one years later, I'm gonna have a talk with Aldo about this. I can promise you about that. I, <laughs> amazing story. I, you know, I, I remember the tournament vividly, Bello, in, in, in Manhattan, and it's a shame I didn't get a chance to see it. And um, you know, I just think Australian. Bowling tournaments in Australia uh, have been a wonderful part of my career and uh, also made me a, a better bowler. But I'll never forget, to all the people watching out there, I will never forget the first time I watched you throw a bowling ball. I was sitting in the stands. We were bowling a Skins Game Challenge tournament at uh, Mount Cravat Lanes in, in Brisbane. Uh, and um, it was for Coca-Cola, I believe. and uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi, one of the two soft drink companies. And I see, and we're practicing, uh, your group was practicing, coming up to practice. And uh, I'm sitting in the stands with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Um, we were down there together. And I'm also sitting with one of our best mates, Andrew Frawley. And I see this young kid standing in the back of the approach, perf, you know, skinny, just gangly. And he runs to the front foul line and throws it with two hands. And I went, what just happened? So I watched the ball go down the lane. I'm like, 
that obviously was had to be a joke. So I look at Brenda, and I, I can't say exactly what I said. Uh, I, you get your ball back, and you do it again. And I went, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. And then Andrew talks to me and says, this is the kid I was telling you about. I said, this is, this is the two-handed kid we've, we've been talking about. I said, and then shot after shot after shot, I'm watching the same thing. And, I'm, and you're throwing pins everywhere. And I'm like, oh, my God. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I couldn't believe what I was watching. So, um, you know, fresh faced kid, full of confidence, um, just, you know, no fear in his eyes, you know, never blinked. And I'm, I, and I'm watching this unfold in front of me. And I, and I said to myself, I looked at Andrew, I looked at my, my, my girlfriend, Brenda, who's now my wife. I said, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, we got to get this kid's phone, boss. We got to, I mean, I got to, I got to learn more about this kid. <laughs> I called the, uh, I called the head of Storm, Bill Christman, our, you know, our owner and uh, uh, the guy that started Storm Products, who's, who's very special to both you and I and, and been instrumental in our lives on so many different levels. I said, Bill, I've just seen something I've never seen before. I said, there's a 16 year old kid down here throwing, running from the back of the approach throwing it with two hands and pins are th going everywhere. And uh, he's got a Brunswick shirt on right now. And we got to make sure that he doesn't get Brunswick balls because I know Heritage Bay is after him. So we got to get him some bowling balls. <laughs> that was my I first remember that. It was, the, uh, it was the, the Brunswick red alert night flash that I was, yeah. I was pegging yeah. down the lane back then. And that was when I obviously I first w witnessed you bowl for the very first time. And uh, I don't know, you know, there are plenty of movies out there where the boy sees the girl from across the room and everything <laughs> goes in slow motion. For me, that's how it was when I saw Timmy Mac throw, his, throw the first ball down the lane uh, ever. I'm like, oh, my God, I think I'm in love with this guy. I've got to watch everything <laughs> that he does. And then little did I know, you know, from that moment on, we would start traveling around the world. We would compete all through Asia, through Europe, um, some of the amateur stuff in, in the U.S. And uh, I credit you, Timmy, for a lot of the um, – the parts of my game that I think I've developed over the years to watching, watching you compete. And you were doing things to a bowling ball that, um, you know, I could curve it and I could rev it, but the way that you were able to control what you were able to do, the high revving, super powerful ball, but the control and touch that you had at the bottom, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to replicate that, you know, and I wanted to, to copy that. And then the other thing that I think I really learned from you was how to win. You know, it's not easy to win when you're in a situation where, you know, you can win or you can lose. It's that, that last moment. I watched you win more times than you ever lost. And learning how to win, I think, is a part of, of sports that, you know, you hear it a lot too in, in some teams, you know, they, they just don't know how to win. And then you've got other teams like I use the Patriots in, as an American football example they just know how to win. They get it done. It looks like they're not going to get it done, but somehow they get it done, you know. And you, to me, um, you were a patriot type of bowler. When you had a chance, just a chance, you would spare a 210 or you would, you know, messenger strike for the win. Whatever it was, you just found a way to win. And I really, you know, I learned a lot from you. Plus, plus, let's not, you know, talk about all the dinners that we've had and just picking your brain constantly i'm sure at some point you must have you know gone man his kid is uh is really annoying me he's constantly asking me a thousand questions you know it's it's first off i i i gotta thank you for the incredible uh words you've just said um you know you know i want to fast forward to today you know you're the best bowler on the planet and i've got a front row seat to history and i get to watch our you know for me the greatest that I've ever seen, which is you, uh, do it week in, week out when I'm out there on tour. So um, to know that back when, when we first met and then, as you said, we traveled together, um, we, we spent so much time together going tournament to tournament, learning things from one another, uh, picking each other's brains. You know, you, would, you were asking me questions. We would talk about scenarios, situations. We'd watch tournaments. We'd watch everything unfold. We'd have a squad. We'd go back and talk about that squad about what we could do better for the next squad. And to know that I've been able to, you know, have some sort of influence on, uh, you know, in your, in your success, in, in, in your journey is, you know, is humbling. Um, it's gratifying. It's um, as your mate and as your friend, uh, you know, and, and your uh, friend of your families, it's, uh, 
you know, extreme, extremely meaningful to me, you know, on, on a number of different levels. Um, you know, when we were going through that process, uh, and I, I think one of the things that uh, has helped me today with how I see you bowl and what maybe you helped you when you saw me bowl is our shot shapes and patterns. I'm able to see the lane, you know, a vision, the lane, the way you, you your shot shapes. So, um, I think well, and that's the thing, right, Timmy? Like, so you as a competitor and what I was watching, I tried to replicate that shot shape. And now as the years have gone by and, um, you know, you've had some injuries along the way and you've transitioned yourself from, you know, a champion on the lane to one of the best tour reps that I've ever had, um, that's where and why I think there's a lot of trust with my game um, and you because, one, I've tried to replicate a lot of the shot shapes that you would create. So you're very familiar looking at that ball shape. But two, I, I would be, it would probably be a fair statement that between yourself and maybe Andrew Frawley, but I would almost say now you've probably gone past um, Frawl. You have probably seen my bowling ball go down a lane more than anyone else in the world. And that's including my parents, who probably watched <laughs> a lot of bowling balls go down the lane. Yeah. The kid. But we've traveled a lot. And, and when we are on tour, you are someone who I, I truly I truly lean on in those moments when I think, like, for the most part, I'll try to work stuff out myself, but then there are moments where I'm, I'm a little clueless. And I, I always trust and respect you and your decisions and what your input is. And that's kind of leading into my next question is, as someone who is such a, a fierce competitor, someone who just loves throwing the ball down the lane, how has the transition been since the injuries into something like a coaching role, which you've excelled at as well around the world, but um, more specifically to me as a tour rep, um, tell me how, how that transition has been for you. Listen, listen it's, it's been a challenge on a number of different levels. I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, you know, repping each player is a little bit different, uh, but uh, I think one of the things that has helped me uh, have a, a, a seamless transition with a lot of guys such as yourself is that you mentioned it earlier is that trust level and the fact that uh, I've been in your shoes and st stood on the lanes and I've competed, you know, against you and also with you and on the lanes beside you and a lot of the guys that are out there. So uh, I, I think there's a blank of trust there that, um, you know, as a bowler, you, you know, I know what you're feeling when you have 54 in the fourth and don't have a double. I also know what you're feeling when you need to shoot, you know, 550 the last two games. Uh, you know, to make a cut or or to get to a TV show or to, you know, put yourself in position, you know, to to, to win the bowling tournament. Um, so I, I think I can relate on a lot of different levels like that. And I think that I brought that type of mentality and that type of um, experience from me being on the lanes to, to try to uh, incorporate that into whoever I'm working with. Whether it's yourself. Do you enjoy it though, Timmy? Do you enjoy the coaching? Do you enjoy the the tour repping side of, of your career? You know, I, I've enjoyed trying to help make people reach their dreams and reach their goals, and and obviously help our company be the best company in the world. Um, I, I'll say this: I mean, I don't think there's any substitute, uh, Belmo, for throwing it. I don't think there's any substitute for you know having the ball in your hands and throwing it. But um, I've, I, I've patterned myself to try to live vicariously through our staff uh, and, and try to help those, you know, the, you know, our, you guys, you know, get to where you need to get to, to, to achieve your dreams and goals. So um, what I say is, is as you fork as uh, throwing that strike that I threw at the Samo cup, you know, when I came back from my shoulder surgeries and uh, you know, it, it, to win um, it's not the same, but can I say that the euphoria that I felt when, Myself and, and Doug Kent and Jim Callahan and Steve Jacobs and Bill Christman was just to my left when you broke the all-time major record in Detroit. That euphoria and that emotion that I felt then um, was just as, you know, was as strong and powerful in a different way. Um, so, uh, you know, th there's certainly a lot of things that I do enjoy about it. Um, but, you know, as a competitor myself, you know, obviously I love throwing the ball. And uh, I always believe in my heart that, um, you know, I can, you know, I'll get the job done no matter what, no matter how far back I am. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, you touched on. I know I've heard you in some interviews over the course of, you know, this, this whole COVID situation, um, the patience that, I, you know, I carried myself as a bowler 
um, that you carry yourself with, it's fun for me to watch because, you know, I had those same types of things over the long course, over the long haul, over a lot of games. And I think that's the one thing where you grew up being in Australia, which has been uh, phenomenal for your development as a player. You guys bowl a lot of games in their tournaments there. And uh, I think that helped your mindset from an early age to realize that, hey, you don't have to get it all right now. Um, and, it, and over time, you added that uh, to your arsenal of, of being just the most patient and most um, uh, knowing when to flick the switch. We talk about it. You and I talk about it. Hey, it's time to flick the switch, time to step on the gas. Knowing when to flick that switch, but also knowing when to, you know, to, to steer the boat in the right direction. You're the one best of my favorite actor. quotes. One of my favorite quotes, Timmy, when you're bowling, and I and we joke about it when when uh, when I'm bowling on tour, and I say it wherever I am, um, is there was a tournament, and I don't remember the specific one, but I remember you were kind of struggling a little bit, and I said, "Hey, Timmy, you know how are you going?" And you said to me, "I'm right where I want to be," and <laughs> and I look at that, and I I see myself now, and like I'll be on the leaderboards in say 70th position. And somebody will ask me, hey, how's it going? And I always say to them, I'm right where I want to be. And it, was this, it gives you this, this added confidence of, all yep. right, you're not leading right now, but hey, you're still going to get there. And by the end of this tournament, you're going to hold the trophy. And right now, you're right where you want to be to make that run. And I, I say that every time yeah. someone asks me where I am and what I'm doing on the lane. And that's something that obviously, you know, I, I've taken from you. I mean, in all of my wins, Timmy, uh, one of the parts that I really, really enjoy is going back and giving you a hug afterwards because oh, yeah. those that don't know you personally, um, they don't see the work that you're putting in uh, when when the TV cameras aren't rolling. But the one thing that no one will ever take away from you is you uh, you are personally invested in each of the players that you work with. You want them all to have success. You, you don't wish ill upon any of your plays. You don't want me or any other player to have any more or less success just because we're friends. And you, you are committed to that. There's a passion for success, whether it's you throwing the ball in the lane yourself or helping someone else. So when I give you that hug and I and you squeeze me, actually you're one of the strongest guys I know too, but you squeeze me, I feel that squeeze. You know, Apart from a few vertebrae cracking um, <laughs> along the back of my spine, uh, I know that that hug is a genuine, a genuine hug, and, and that's one of the main reasons why I love you, Tim. Yeah, we, I mean, listen, we've had a lot of those hugs over the years, and um, you know, when, when, whenever these chapters, you know, each, I, we talk about it all the time. We create creating new chapters and and creating um, new moments and new memories. And um, you know, as I said, the euphoria that I felt, and, and the you know the you know I'm a I'm an emotional guy. I, when I bowled, I I, I wore it right on my sleeve. And, um, you know, I've got no, no problem, you know, expressing that to you when I see the happiness when you win a tournament or, um, you know, you get the job done and, uh, you know, it's meaningful to me because it, it is personal, you know, you know, it is personal because you watch someone's journey throughout the week and, and you watch what they, the ebb and flows of the emotional ups and downs that bowlers have to deal with to have success and to win. And I don't think people really realize how hard and how difficult it is to win, to win anything, to win a six gamer down the street, to win, you know, the orange open, to win the world championship and to, you know, to win the super slam, which two people on the planet have done. And I'm speaking to the one, you know, that's one of them. It's, it, you know, winning is extremely difficult. And when we can have those moments, you know, uh, listen, we're in a kind of a, when you, when you're repping, you're in a, you're, I don't want to say you're not in a no win situation, but you know, we're expected to win and we want to go out and win. Um, and when we don't win, we're, we're extremely, you know, sad and, and emotional. Uh, but when we do win, it's also uh, the euphoria, but also a relief as well. So I think, yeah, and bowling is one of those games to me. Bowling is, is, you know, you can have a high level of success, uh, and I, I often use Walter Ray as this example is, you know, we, we talk of Walter Ray about the most winningest player in PBA history. And he has, what, 47 um, PBA national titles. And yet he's played over a thousand tournaments. So That's right. that means he's won 47 and he's lost 
953 other events. So right. you lose far more than, than you ever win. And one of the things that I have really leaned on in my career is my significant other, is Kimberly, my wife, who, yeah, when you see me and I'm on television and I win, yeah, I'm happy, everything's going great. But all those other tournaments, there is a feeling of, man, I, I, feel, I don't feel like I performed great. You're on, a, you're on the downhill of, of the emotional roller coaster. And it's really, really difficult. And I know Brenda, for you, has obviously also been uh, that rock. I mean, you are a very emotional person. When you're high, you're high. And when you're low, it can come down. So how has Brenda helped you over your career um, to kind of deal with that emotional roller coaster? I, I, I think, listen, Jason, I think there's a lot of similarities in the fact that we both have incredible uh, partners in life. And um, we both know what the sacrifice is. On both sides, you you know, Kimberly knows the sacrifice that she has to make, you know, when you're gone, taking care of, you know, your, your your lovely children. And also, Brenda, the sacrifice that she has to make when I was gone. And then obviously now having my daughter, Lana, it makes it um, it makes it difficult. Yeah. But you have to be able to connect and convey and have a support network and uh, be able to be honest with one another to, you know, to be able to get over those those low moments that you talk about. You know, I, I you know, I try, I, I tried to get better at it over over time. You know, the, the ebb and flows of the ups and downs, and um, yeah, it's difficult. You know, the, there's something I still work on every day, uh, ch trying not to get too high, trying to get too low. But uh, as you said, you know, uh, you know, when I, I'm, I'm invested, and my wife has been, you know, we've I've been through a, a lot. You know, um, especially when. You know, right before I had to have my surgeries uh, on my shoulder, and you know, I was one. I was. I felt like I was one of the best on the planet, or could could bowl with anybody on the planet at that time. And then it's it's taken away from taken away from you at 34 years of age, um, and this is all you've known. You know, and then the next thing you know, you're on a table, uh, and you don't know what's going to happen, and you don't know if you're ever going to be able to pick your arm up again. And uh, you know. You, you have some, you need someone to lean on, you know, you've lived your whole life vicariously, you know, in a sport um, that's, it, I don't want to say it's defined you, but it, it, it's, it, listen, it's brought me, my wife, my daughter, my family, you know, it, it, bowling is what, you know, what, what I've been so driven and so passionate about for, you know, more than half my life. Um, and you need those times and moments where you need, you need uh, that voice of reason. I like to call her and Brenda's my, been not only my support network, but my voice of reason. And I think that's what you're referring to in regards to Kimberly as well. Yeah. And she's one of the, the, the kindest and sweetest people that I've ever met. I'm sure she's somewhere if she's not working, um, which I'll get to in a, in a minute, but if she is, uh, Brenda, I love you. Um, <laughs> so Brenda and Kimberly also have some other similarities. Uh, Brenda's a nurse. Kimberly is also a registered nurse. Um, with the, the pandemic that's going on right now, and I don't want to I don't want to talk about the pandemic too much here, but um, you know it's 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 tough knowing that your wife is putting herself at, at a higher risk than normal people by, while working at hospitals where sick people are going. Um, how is she doing? How's um, COVID treating you and your family? And uh, what's the status there um, uh, in India? Yeah, listen, I, like you said, I want to try to keep it as positive as possible. But I also think, you know, with the current situation that we're in, bowling's resilient, right? We're, 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 we're going to get through this and we're going to survive no matter what. We're going to be better for it on the other side because we're going to be smarter. But as you said, Kimberly being a nurse and also my wife is a medical ICU nurse. Uh, I have, I'll be honest with you, Jason, these last 45 days, every time my wife goes to work, I have a hard time sleeping. You know, she's on the front lines. I equate it to like you and I are across the street and a, a house is on fire and the firemen are hosing down the house and the nurses are inside because they're dealing with COVID positive patients at all times. Uh, this unknown, uh, you know, virus that, you know, we know so little about that we're learning on the fly. So there's been a lot of sleepless nights, but uh, you know, we're doing the best we can. I will say on the positive note, I've gotten to see my daughter and my wife every single day for, since March 16th. Um, and it's been, that's been a joy. I don't know the last time that that's happened, um, other than when obviously I've had surgery, but I've been able to move around a little bit. So I've been able to see them and, and have a lot of talks and a lot of good discussion, a lot of good quality time with my daughter. But, um, you know, my wife, like all the frontline people out there are, 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 are definitely at a higher risk. And, uh, 
it just shows you how special they are and uh, how committed they are to helping this pandemic go away. And I, I salute her and love her and all, all the people that are, that, that are, that are out there on the front lines. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for everything. Absolutely. No, I feel the, I, I mirror the exact same sentiments that you just said. I want to, um, I want to change gear here a little bit and I want to, uh, bring in a, a, a question from the chat room here and I'm going to read it. Um, it's from, um, Kaya RL, uh, K Y A R L. And, uh, this is actually something that I, I see said quite a lot, and I kind of want to get your take on this. Uh, sure. His comment is, so basically, if you want to be good at bowling, then you have to have rich parents who own a bowling alley. And uh, I think, you know, from my perspective, my parents, when they built the bowling center, were, were not rich. I don't think they're considered rich today either. But I do have access to a bowling center, which has been a huge advantage. But the comment that he makes here is, it's, it's a very general statement, and I, I sure. disagree with that. I don't think you need to own a bowling center to be really good at. Did you own a bowling center, Timmy, when you were growing up? No, I, Jason. I'm gonna tell you, I, if you want to be great at something, it's all about effort and determination and and the will to be great at something. Um, where I grew up, I grew up in the woods in Pennsylvania. Uh, we lived. Our closest bowling center was 35 minutes, 30 minutes away. You know, and it's about what you put into it and, and, and what you're willing to sacrifice to be, you know, to, to, to get to get good or to be good or what your goal is. Where is your goal? Do you want to be here? Well, then that's what you're, you're going to attain. If you put your goal to the, the sky or the stars, you know, if you got the right work ethic and the right um, mindset and the right frame of mind, um, you know, you, you, greatness can be achieved at at without your parents owning a bowling center, I can promise you. Um, yeah, I, and I, I think it's not, it's, it's not really a, it's not like, um, you know, I'm not judging the question because it is a question right. that you see quite regularly. And I see it not just with bowling, it can be with anything. I think when people see uh, success, there, there is two things that happen. One, if you want that success, you kind of, you know, have that, oh, I wish it were me. You know, I wish that were me. And then two, uh, the second thing they typically wish for is, I wish it was as easy for me as it was someone else. But a lot of the time, those stories aren't easy. It's just you happen to catch the back end of the story, which is the success part, and you don't see what is put in in the beginning of the story. So whether you are an uh, aspiring bowler, whether you're an aspiring artist or you want to get into finance, or whatever your career path that you want to choose from, I, my advice is, don't look at what others' end stories are, right? Don't look at the, the Elon Musk of the world and see them now or the Bill Gates and see them now and just go, oh, it's easy for them. They're multi-millionaire billionaires and they've got everything, all the resources in the world. There was a time when they didn't and you're at that point in your story. So look towards how you can grow, how you can improve your own story without looking at someone else's end game and be like, oh, I wish I could just click my fingers and be there. Because from your career, as I've known it, um, for as long as I've known you through my career, uh, I haven't had the success that I'm having right now every step of the way. I lost a lot. I spent a lot of money um, trying to be good and not doing very well. And then you go back to the drawing board and the comment that you made, which I think really needs to be highlighted is, it's up to you, right? How much effort are you willing to put into this? How much determination do you have? You live 35 minutes from a bowling center. Is that going to stop you from catching a lift where possible, forcing people to take you to the bowling center where possible? And when you are at the age where you have the luxury of driving yourself and maybe a little extra disposable income, then spending it where you want to spend it to achieve a dream that you have. So, um, I appreciate the, the comment that was made, but I also very, very much disagree with it. Yeah, hard work, just how hard do you want to work, really? That's what, that's what you have to ask yourself. How hard do you want to work? You know, it's, uh, you know every, everybody's got their, got their goal. What's your goal going to be? Do you want to dig your spikes in and, 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 and make that extra effort? You know, or do you just want to put your hood on and say, woe is me. I don't have what he has, so I can't get there. So. That's not how I've ever lived my life. So I agree with you, Jason, 100%. There's another comment here from uh, one of my best mates as well, Jared Lane. I want to I share this with you. Jared, I have Jared. Uh, he, writes, yeah. 
one of the best weeks of my life was my first trip to Vegas with you. Thanks, Timmy, for the Super Bowl party hookup, even though the Aussie crew had no clue what was happening in the game. (laughs) (laughs) That was fantastic. It was all of us together. I think it was uh, 2006. Um, We were uh, watching the Indianapolis Colts play the Chicago Bears. I think that's that's what it was. We took the picture outside with our big group. Uh, Yeah, you you guys are the Aussie rules. uh, Football things are a little bit different there, but um, what a phenomenal time! I'll never forget it. You know these memories that we we've been able to create. I'm I'm very thankful for Jared. I hope you and your family are doing great and uh, come back over and watch some more American football. And uh, hopefully it's on on the telly soon. Yeah, absolutely. I'll make sure. I'm sure I'll talk to him today. We talk nearly on a daily basis, so I'll yeah, be sure to. That's to fantastic. Be, I mean, if he, if he, I'm sure he's watching because he he wrote a comment, but I'll say good day to you. <laughs> say good day to him for you anyway. Uh, Timmy, you're talking about memories, um, and we all have that one kind of event that sticks out for our own personal careers. Is there is there one tournament, um, and you don't have to necessarily, um, you know, have to share all the personal sides of the details if you don't want sure. to. But is there that one tournament that you're like, you know what? Because I won that one, that's 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 all that really matters. If you take that one away from me, then I feel like there's a hole in my career missing. I think, um, I mean, there's a couple that really stick out in in place for me. Um, My first big international win when I won in Singapore, it kind of got me going. Um, And then uh, 2001, I won the biggest tournament in Europe at the Pergamon Open when my grandmother passed away. Um, And it was a crazy scenario how I ended up coming back and winning the bowling tournament when uh, the lane condition was impossible. But, um, you know, uh, you were there when one of my biggest wins, hands down, and, you know, I, I referenced it earlier was at the Samo Cup in 2009 when uh, I was coming back from shoulder surgeries. And, um, you know, they, they kind of kind of wrote me off. And, um, you know, it was at that time, it was a, 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 P, a Korean PBA major and a Japanese PBA major. And the PBA was affiliated. We, had a, we obviously had a bunch of bowlers over there. And, um, you know, we bowled a bunch of games of qualifying. And it was the proper bowling format that, that I embraced as well, kind of like you, because I always said to myself, which – um, you know, was one of the things we talked about in, in the growth of your career. If you give me enough games, I'll get there. And uh, it's the one thing I tell everybody today. If you give Belmo enough games, he's going to run you down. It's just that's what's going to happen. So uh, 2000, and, you know, that, that, that tournament in the Sam Oak Cup sticks out in my mind. With Bill Christman there and Barb Christman there, um, you know, it being a, a big uh, major championship over there, uh, for me to, um, you know, get the number one seed, in a star-studded field, I mean, yourself was there, Parker Bone, Pete Weber, um, you know, Wes Vallott, Rash, you know, Doug Kent. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's a, you know, a who's who in our in our sport. On, on top of the fact of the great Korean bowlers and how the lane conditions are over there. Uh, finding a way to, you know, I got catching that lucky strike in the ninth um, and then recomposing myself. I actually looked over to you and I, you said, come on, make it count, throw this one good, and I'll never forget it. And uh, I threw two of the best shots of my career to, to seal the deal uh, and win a, win a big major. And, uh, yeah, and then you smashed the approach with your hand, broke your yeah, watch. Yeah, I broke my mean... watch. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I just, yes, yes, because I looked at Bill and I said, that's right, Bill. That's what I'm talking about. I won't, you know, on TV. And uh, he was up out of his chair, and it was a weird scenario for him because he's the tournament sponsor, you know, and, you know, part of the group and he's out of his chair. Cause you know, I'm one of his kind of one of his, his boys and uh, go over and hug Barb. And then I, I actually sent you a picture of you and I, uh, you hugging me. It was yeah. like, a, it's, it's weird. We talk about it because it was one of those times where, you know, I won one of my big tournaments, you hugging me. And obviously I've sent you some pictures that have been very meaningful to me of me hugging you when you, you've won your major. So, um, yeah, I would say, Jason, that one ranks up there. That's in the top three for sure. You got a chance to see it. So that was a big moment, no yeah, doubt about it. I, I consider myself very lucky to see that comeback victory. I, I really, really do. All right, I've got two more questions for you, Timmy. One from the from the chat, and um, yep. it's, uh, it's a little bit of a, um, a change of gears, I suppose, because I'm not entirely sure how many people actually know this. I'm just scrolling back to, uh, to find it. But we have... Um, Oh my goodness, where is it? It's it's gone. No, come back. Uh, come back. Um 
and I'm trying to even see who it was from. Um, but the question was, uh, and so, oh, here we go. Um, so it's from Preppy Punk, New York City, NYC. Uh, and the right. question that he has was, um, no, sorry, 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 sorry. I apologize, Preppy Punk, NYC. It's not from you. It's from Dale Diamond. He says, Tim, can you give us a little insight into what it was like to play football under Joe Paterno? Yeah, amazing time in my life. Um, one of those things where uh, it helped shape, mold who I am today and actually how I go about, you know, coaching and teaching and some of the things that I actually talked to you about, Jason, over time and that helped me be, become a better bowler. You know, uh, Penn State University is one of the re most renowned football programs in our country. I played for the greatest team coach of all time, in my opinion, and Joe Paterno, um, the greatest – prepared better than anybody in the history of our, you know, in sport, in my opinion. Um, and I learned so much uh, of never taking no for an answer, uh, you know, and to continue to push and continue to try to persevere. You know, I remember the first time I walked onto the football team there, I was bowling for college and I got tired of, uh, uh, I miss, I miss football. And I had had division two scholarship for football, but I didn't want to play there. So I, uh, I decided I'm going to go walk on and play some play, play college football, Penn state. People thought I was crazy because I'm not the biggest, biggest tool in the shed, but um, I, you know, I, I have this right here, this, this heart here it, it sometimes beats, beats, beats and burns hard. Um, and uh, I just believe that I could do it. I, I got cut the first time and I was in his office and he said, I don't think you have what it takes to play football for us. And I looked him right in the eyes and I said, don't, you know, I'll be back in six months and I'll say, don't say I didn't tell you so because I'll make this team and I'm going to, help us win a championship and uh, I'm going to be part of something special here. And my perseverance and not taking no for an answer and the turning a negative into a positive saying, okay, you don't think I can do it. Oh, I'll show you. I can do it. I'm going to prove to you that I can do it. And I just, it, it encompassed me and it, the, the drive that I had to, to, to find a way to put, put the blue and white on and buckle that chin strap. I was going to do whatever it took to make that team. And uh, you know, I persevered and, played up with some amazing, amazing uh, teammates. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no substitute for holding hands with guys and walking out of the tunnel in front of 110,000 people and, and hearing them scream, we are Penn State. Just, I, I get chills thinking about it today. So um, that experience to me, to me, because, you know, when you're banging heads with your teammates and running people over and, you know, you're sweating and you're bleeding, and, but you're all for one common goal. You know, all 11 guys, if everybody just does their job, you know, you know, you're going to have success. So I always say, do your job and always do the right thing. If you do the right thing, eventually good things happen. Don't cut corners, just do the right thing. You might not get it immediately, but eventually good things happen. So, you know, um, I always use that mantra of saying, don't, don't tell me you can't do it because you can't isn't in the vocabulary. And I learned a lot of that at Penn state and, and I carried a lot of that into my bowling and, uh, you know, I always, I always, I always welcomed, you know, people thinking, ah, he's done. He's out of it. He's gone. He's, he's not, he's not coming back. And, and, and the chase, you know, sometimes, and I, you and I have talked about this. Sometimes the chase is more rewarding than going out and leading by three or 400. And sometimes, oh, yeah. I mean, we, we referenced it a little bit earlier when you're like, uh, I'm right where I want to be. Right. It's the, right. the self-confidence, right. the self-belief, but it's also, That's right. it's a story. It's the story. It's, it's if I catch them from here, not only will I have some personal uh, validation of my performance, but this will be a story that I, I, I can feed off another time. And it, it'll build, it, 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 it builds more, just more confidence. It just it builds the uh, aura around yourself, right? You know, the, 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 the bubble becomes bigger. You know, I, I remember one time in Oklahoma, I believe, I, thought, I think you bowled 125 or 130 game one. And the scoring pace was crazy. <laughs> and it was like a 14-game tournament. And they said, he can't get there. He got there. Or you, and one time you, you did it and you almost got there again. So uh, those moments um, that, you know, of never giving up, never quitting, never, you know, which have, you know, it really helped me today, especially since these, all these uh, subsequent surgeries on my leg, to never quit and never throw in the towel um, are, are some of the things I learned at Penn State. So thanks for the question. I really appreciate it. And uh, go Penn State. Yeah, great answer. Great words of wisdom. Uh, Timmy, my last question for you, it's called In the Clutch, okay? 
the question you've got uh, in front of you right now is you've got one shot. You've got one strike to get, and you can choose any bowling ball, past or present. What's the ball that you're pulling out of the bag to throw one strike to save your life? Wow. Well, it depends. Are we, are we bowling on 1995 oils? Are we bowling on 2000 and, <laughs> 2000, 2020 oils? It oh, doesn't man, matter. A, it's a ball that transcends time for you. It could be any oil pattern in the world. It's just someone says, as a gun to your head, you got to throw me a strike. You can pick any ball out of this lot. What do you pick? Uh, I, I, I'll tell you what. It, it might not be the most popular, but back in the day, uh, it's it's the Trauma ER and the X-Factor Deuce. Those are the two combos. So um, the Trauma ER won, won me a lot of tournaments and won, won a lot won a lot, of, a lot a lot of money for me. And uh and then, uh, and then it got a chunk out of it. And then my my good young mate said, "Hey, wake up! You know, you tour rep me. You didn't even know you were tour repping me. I, I, I didn't mean to elaborate on the question, but in 2003 at the South Pacific, we're bowling the tournament at Mar at Moravin, AMF Moravin. Uh -huh. I'm on lanes three and four. I bowl 300 with my favorite trauma ER. It's it's the best ball ever. It's it's won me. I got all the confidence in the world. And I'm leading the tournament and I'm starting to go." And then my ball comes back with a giant hole in it. And I get dirty. And I mean dirty. And you put your arm around me and say, come on, mate. You know, you, you gave me the you gave me the pep talk I needed. I gave you the pep talk. <laughs> that was the worst decision I ever made because there was a chance I could have finally beaten Timmy back in one of these tournaments. And then you decided <laughs> to go back to that same pair and shoot 300 again. And I'm like, with oh. the, yeah, with the X Factor <laughs> deuce. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, those moments you, you never forget. But, uh, you know, if you're putting a gun to my head and you know you're saying, "Hey, you got to throw a strike," I threw some big strikes with, the, with with that ball and that other ball. So I'd have to say that. Yep, mate. I I've really enjoyed our conversation. This is the type of conversation we have on a on a regular basis, but I'm glad we can yeah. share it with those that are watching on YouTube. I I can't thank you enough for for giving me your time, for being open and honest and as energetic as always. I hope you have a, a great evening. Kiss Brenda and and Lana for me and say hi. Um, and I'm sure I'll be texting you real soon. Yeah, mate, listen, just w one quick thing before we go. You know, a lot of the world's in a crazy place right now. And uh, the stuff that you're doing with the Belmo Show and all the things you're doing for our sport and the stuff that you have done, you know, for me personally, I, you know, I'm extremely grateful for. But, uh, you know, the fact that we, uh, you know, we're in this we're in this together. And uh, I'm just so thankful to be on this ride, this special ride that you've, you've given me, uh, you know, the, these last you know, years, you know, it's been, it's, it's been amazing. And uh, as I said, best of your family and uh, you know, we'll all be back. I'll be over in Europe and we'll be back on tour. We'll be working together and we'll, all this will be, we'll, 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 we'll be just fine. Stay positive. Keep your, keep the faith and uh, keep, uh, keep watching, uh, keep watching Belmo uh, create history. Thanks guys. <laughs> See you soon. See you mate. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Timmy Mack. I mean, as promised, <laughs> incredibly entertaining. Well, I just, I love that guy so much. Um, he's such a, a positive role model for, for everyone out there. Uh, if you ever get a chance to bump into him, shake his hand, say good day. Uh, trust me, you're going to absolutely love talking to Timmy Mack. And over the years, Timmy Mack has shared with me a whole bunch of information. So now it's my turn to share a little bit of information with you about how to increase your rev rate or decrease it in the classroom. All right, so the classroom is about rev rate. I've got my uh, bowling ball right here, Storm High Road uh, Classic. And this is the tip about how to increase and decrease your rev rate. I'm going to move over a little bit. Wrong way. I need to move over a little bit so you can see it. Now, a bowling ball, you've got your finger holes there. Um, hopefully you can see them or somewhat see them. Uh, yeah, there they are. So I want you guys to imagine that this bowling ball is a globe and that if you were to draw a line around the middle, like the equator of Earth, uh, it would separate the ball into a northern and southern hemisphere. And that's important to realize because when you are going to release the bowling ball, depending on where your fingers are in relation to the hemispheres of the bowling ball will determine the potential rev count that you can get. 
So a typical one-handed, I'm going to stand up here, so hopefully you can still see it okay. But a typical traditional stroker is going to release the ball with his hand more on the inside, on the, on more on the top of the ball. That's the equator. My hand is in the northern hemisphere. So as I go to let go of that ball, you'll see my hand is on the top half. It'll rotate ever so slightly and the fingers will come out but I'm only able to generate a very low count rev rate. If I am a cranker, my hand will come under the ball. Now my hand is in the southern hemisphere of the ball at the release. So as it comes through, as my hand is here, if I rotate my hand, you can see how much more time the fingers are still in the ball before they come out. So you match that with the quickness of the flick of the release. If I rotate slowly, even if I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, the ball won't rotate very quickly. But if I use my wrist, having my fingers in the Southern Hemisphere of the ball and rotate really fast, you generate more rotation. So this is where the advantage of a two-handed player really comes into effect because now I can really cut my fingers and my fingers have literally gone from the Northern Hemisphere all the way around to the Southern Hemisphere and almost back to the equator. So I'm almost back to where the middle of the ball is. So if I was to stand here and rotate it again, you can see how far my hand can rotate around the ball. So if you go quickly as a two-handed player and you just really pop your fingers, you can generate a lot more rotation. And the same, can be, uh, the same can be said for decreasing your rev rate. So if I'm going to get my fingers closer, and I'll hold it this way so you can see a bit better, but if I were to get my, no, actually, it's this way, what am I doing? Sorry. If I were to get my hand closer to the top half of the ball, the northern hemisphere, it will decrease the level um, or potential level of rotation because my hand just isn't in the ball long enough. So a lot of players that want to increase their rev rate, they think they need to throw the ball harder. In actual fact, you want to get your hand more into the southern hemisphere of that ball so your fingers stay in the ball just a little bit longer. And of course, the opposite if you're looking to decrease your rev rate. So practice that. You can do that here at home while we're still in COVID right now. You can set up a couple of pillows um, against a, a wall or a door. Uh, or maybe quite a few pillows and grab your bowling ball and learn to get your hand, practice getting your hand more in that Southern hemisphere. If you're looking to increase it, if you're looking to decrease it, get that hand more into the Northern hemisphere of the ball at the release point. Um, and that's your tip. So I'd like to thank Storm Bowling, uh, my personal sponsor for sponsoring the classroom. Thank you very much, Storm. Uh, but that's it from me in the classroom. We'll head back to our final segment. Like always, guys, I promise you guys a giveaway. This is no different. I'm really looking forward to uh, giving one of you guys a chance to win. So we'll head over to the giveaway page where we can find our winner. So we've got two minutes before the giveaway happens. And here are some of the things that you need to do. I need you guys, okay, to type in the chat room, right? I want you to type in there jasonbelmonte.com. And you also need to be a subscriber of my channel. After the show is done, I'll go through the chat room, randomly pick someone, make sure that you guys are also a subscriber. And if you are, you're going to have a chance to win one of these four items. We're about to spin the wheel in a second, but you can win a hat, an autograph card, a personalized video, or some Belmo stocks. And I'll send them anywhere in the world. So again, all you need to do is write my personal website in the comments as a separate chat, www. Did I say too many W's? www.jasonbelmonte.com. Um, if you do that, you can win. Uh, I think we also have the ability to type in uh, exclamation point raffle. So you can do one of those two options, but then I will go through and look for a winner. Let's spin that wheel. And let's see what the prize is going to be today. As it spins and spins and spins and spins. 
still spinning. <laughs> the longest spin in history. Uh, I think it's starting to slow down now. Here it comes. Here it comes. It's, is it slowing or is it speeding up? I can't tell. <laughs> oh, this is the longest spin ever. It may never stop spinning. It may be spinning till next week's episode. And then we'll we'll have to give away two prizes as on the one spin. All right, here we go. Slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and it's going to be a personalized autograph card. That is the prize that we're going to have. So, uh, like I said, uh, I'll go through the chat room, have a look to see who's going to win. I think we had some technical difficulties as well on my end. Not. Not this is my, my, I'm a rookie at these live shows, but you could have uh, typed in exclamation point raffle. So I'm going to look through exclamation point raffle and the chat, put them all together. If you happen to double up, that's fine. Put everyone's entry in together. Uh, make sure you are a subscriber and then I will get in contact with you and make sure I send that personalized autograph card out to you ASAP. Uh, that's it from the giveaway. We'll head over for the 10th frame and the final comment. All right. All right, guys, we're almost done. Show's done. I, I, uh, I got to thank my sponsors. I've got to thank them. These are the kinds of people that allow me to have the freedom to create shows like this. So uh, let's talk about each and every one that has helped me. Stream inspectors right now. You're watching this stream because Stream Inspectors have helped me out. Hit them up at streaminspectors.com if you're interested in a live show that looks similar or better than mine. Storm Bowling, the bowlers company, stormbowling.com. I've used all of my equipment throughout my career on the PBA tour with Storm Bowling Balls, and I wouldn't know anyone else here. Vice Grip, wouldn't put my fingers in any other grip other than Vice. They've helped me succeed on the tour uh, for the last five or six years, and they are the best grips in the world. Uh, Dexter Bowling. Uh, dot com as well if you're looking for the best possible pair of bowling shoes i honestly really tribute a lot of my success to dexter and the way i get to the approach and cloud construct these guys help me build my personal website they're amazing at what they do so if you're interested in the market for a brand new website hit them up cloudconstruct.com and that is all of my <laughs> All right, guys, that's it. The uh, The show is over. Thank you, Timmy Mack, for joining me on the show. I hope you learned a little something in the classroom, and I'm looking forward to getting back into this chat room really, really soon, picking out that random winner and sending them their autograph card. I cannot wait to do the Belmo show again. Uh, the guest that I'm going to have, I'm actually teeing up two different times. Uh, it's actually depending on their schedules who's going to be first. It could either be Carl Troop, Tom Clark, the commissioner of the PBA, and Rob Stone, the voice uh, in the commentary box uh, for the PBA Fox telecast. So it'll be one of those three guys coming up next. Uh, but again, I couldn't have done the show without my mate Zach in the background from uh, Stream Inspectors. Thank you, Zach, and all of your team for running the feed as well as you do. Until next week, so the show is back on the air here on YouTube, please. Subscribe to my channel so you don't miss it. Thank you for watching. Peace, everyone.